All right, we're good to go. Lizzie Smith, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. You have yeah, all yeah. the best swimmers on your podcast. I'm excited to be added to that collection. Well, I'm lining them up and you're one of them. So thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Um, where are you coming from? I'm currently in Austin, Texas. Okay. How long have you lived there? I've lived here for the last four years. Nice. Ended up in Austin road tripping and it had everything I liked in a city. Good swimming, good food. So yeah. I stay. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a cool road trip and and definitely, yeah, they, they do have everything. It's It's one of those cities that people move to and, and never move move away from so yeah. um pretty cool but uh, well listen for those that don't know you maybe in the swimming my swimming world because I'm, I'm in the olympic you're a you're a paralympian and uh one of the best in the world so um tell us a little bit about yourself so i am a two-time paralympic swimmer i was born with a condition called amniotic band syndrome so as a result i lost my left arm from a couple inches from the elbow up so that's made me eligible for para sport. But when I grew up swimming, para sport wasn't super well known. So I had no idea that Paralympics existed. So I grew up USA swimming, swimming with able bodied competitors mm. until I found out about Paralympics when I was six years into swimming. So it's been my goal ever since then to be a Paralympian. So now wow. I have two games under my belt, three Paralympic wow. medals, and counting. Fantastic. I mean, incredible. Now, now, just let's go back to the beginning. Then you, you said you were born without your, the the full left arm. Is that correct? Yes. So it's called amniotic band syndrome. My parents had no idea before I was born. So I'm the seventh of eight kids. So that's right. Surprise. I did see that. I saw that you had three brothers and four sisters. Massive family. Yes. Yes, it is. And then my boyfriend is one of fifteen. So oh, what? Got a lot of numbers here. <laughs> wow, that's huge. That's incredible. Um, so it, what do you mean by a syndrome? Like uh, what happens exactly? So when I was little, they explained it to me in so many different ways just to make it easier. Right. Or first I had it explained to me, like my mom ate ice cream when she was pregnant and I stuck my arm out to reach for some and <laughs> my arm got frozen. <laughs> and then as I got older, it was explained to me what it actually was. So in the womb, there's little fibroids, and it mm -hmm. got wrapped around my arm and cut off circulation. Oh, oh. So then, um, did they have to amputate it when you were born? No. Luckily, I've had um, no medical issues. So I was born just like this, and then... Oh, oh so it just didn't grow properly then? No. Yeah, so um, right. I don't know what point in, the, in my mom's pregnancy when it happened but mm. cut off circulation and then stop growth. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. That, that makes sense. Now, were your parents shocked by this at the time uh, when, when you were born? Uh, I believe they were. <laughs> I so they, I mean, I mean, they had no idea. They, 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 they weren't able to see like the 3d images or anything like that. No, not at that point in 96, they couldn't, but now parents can see. Right. So it's been cool. Swimming has given me a platform to connect with parents who they can see that the child's going to be born with a similar condition to mine or they reach out oh. and they already have a young kid. Right. So it's nice. I get to kind of show like, here's the path that I took and someone gets to follow when I didn't have that. Yeah. Very cool. I mean, it just, yeah, it'd be, it'd be such a shock to think, Oh, my, my child has a disability and then they see your story and they think to themselves, Oh, wow. There's my, my child can have a full life and be very successful. Yes. And even more than they're going to be okay. But then yep. viewing their disability as, this giant opportunity. And mm. I mean, that's really what para is. It's now we're not at this great disadvantage. Now we have so many doors open to us. Right. Right. That, that's interesting. You know, um, on a, on a much lesser scale, I was actually in and out of hospital for the first five years of my life with asthma. I had very severe asthma uh, as a kid, um, to the point where I'd, I'd spend two weeks in hospital, um, and spend a couple of days at home and then back two weeks in the hospital. I was in and out for the first five years. I can distinctly remember um, a period of time where they had so many drips and needles in my arm that they had to put a plaster cast on my arm because as a kid, I would just rip these things out. But, um, but that's kind of my memory. And, and I remember having a, some severe asthma attacks and, 
and uh, and almost dying. I, I can vividly remember those sorts of things. But the reason why I'm telling you this is because um, for many years beyond kind of the hospitalization, I always thought to myself as having a disability of, of somebody who couldn't do things because I had something wrong with me. And so I always felt like I, I was held back. I was I was ultimately controlled by asthma. Asthma controlled every decision I made, whether I was going to walk down the street, whether I was going to play a certain sport or whatever it was. Um, I, I was living in fear, basically. And it wasn't until about the age of 10 or 11 where I had a mindset switch where I said to myself, like, no, asthma doesn't control me. I control asthma kind of thing. And that was kind of my mental switch. Have Have you had something similar like that? Oh, I think my whole life will be just a lot of learning, a lot of growing and shifting my view on disability. When I was younger, I was drawn to swimming into sport kind of as my way of thinking, like I can escape being in the disability box. I can be so good at this thing that no one will know that I have a disability, that that doesn't have to be my label. Now I get to be just Lizzie, fast swimmer. But as I'm getting older, I'm recognizing the importance of calling it a disability and mm. recognizing that I'm swimming with my disability. And that's the powerful thing that it's with and not despite. And that helps eliminate a lot of shame. Like as a kid, being in and out of the hospital, I'm sure you experienced, but it can be incredibly isolating. It's a lot on a kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if now I can yeah. use what I'm doing with swimming to help make it more inclusive. I think yeah. that's, that's a great gift. Absolutely. Huge gift. And it, it is funny because growing up, uh, even you just saying that, um, I, there was shame involved. Like I was a very, very quiet kid to the point where I wouldn't speak, which is so ironic now that I have a podcast <laughs> because all I do is speak, but um, I was very shy. I was, and I don't know whether I was just afraid to speak because my, my, my breath was so valuable to me, or I was just an extremely shy kid. And I always felt like um, I was different. I always felt like I wasn't worthy of some something, you know, that I was, again, I had that kind of disability, there's something wrong with me type feeling. And so I always felt less than, and, and you're saying that you kind of had some similar feelings growing up then. Oh, I relate to that feeling a hundred percent. I, it took a lot to get me to talk. I did not want to draw attention to myself mm -hmm. in any way. And that was another thing that drew me to the pool was I didn't have to feel if people were staring at me. I didn't have to mm. feel that attention was on me or yeah, have people intruding, trying to make things easier. I was left alone to just swim. But yeah, I was very, very shy. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it is hard to discern out how much of that is that's my personality or is that being different and kind of more of a trauma response? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When did you start to feel more comfortable with yourself? And, and, and again, this is like a lifelong journey. Like you said, there's always going to be moments where you come in and out of it, but in terms of just feeling confident about yourself, when did that process happen? I noticed the biggest shift after the 2016 Paralympic Games, mm. I took 16 months off of swimming. And that's when I ended up road tripping through Austin. But I spent seven months road tripping and I lived out of my car. And I, I mean, I was fully independent. And I had to like, I was a scavenger out there. I was babysitting to get money to fund my trip. So it put me in front of new people every day. So I had to get comfortable with um, being uncomfortable mm -hmm. and like just explaining like I'm different and that's okay. So I became very skilled at that. And then when I moved to Austin and settled down, I had a skill that I previously shied away from because I'm from a small town in Indiana where at least most people knew who I was. So I didn't have to do the whole introduction, almost like out myself with my arm. So mm -hmm. I got a lot better at that. And that gave me more confidence seeing that people responded very welcoming. Mm. Well, why was it, why'd you end up swimming then other than kind of that isolation factor where you could switch the world off a little bit? I've, I've, I can relate to that where you dive in the pool and the whole world disappears. I, I love that feeling. 
sometimes have been in the pool, you can just turn the world off. But um, I would have to think that there may have been other sports that may have been better suited, maybe necessarily to your disability, because with swimming, you do have to feel the water and you have to hold water. But um, was there ever a pull or push to, to go with another sport? Well, I played other sports, but then there was a push by family to swim because my older brother, one older than me, he swam oh. and we lived right by a pool. So I would just hop the fence and spend all day at the pool. Mm. So it was, I mean, it was a very natural draw. I would spend my summer days and I, that's one of those, I don't know how to explain it, but I loved it when I was a kid. Every second I just wanted to spend at the pool in the water, seeing how far I could push off and streamline without kicking. Yeah. Look, I think that there is some natural ability for anyone that gets to our level as as an Olympian, Paralympian. There's a, there's a, a feel, a natural feel for the water. And I've seen you swim. You do look very aquatic. So have you always felt pretty comfortable in the water then? Yeah, I guess I have. I have always felt very comfortable there. It felt as... I don't know, cliche or a lot of swimmers might say, but it did feel like a second home. And part of mm. that was because of my arm. Part of it was just, I liked being in a different world where it is so much different than other sport where we're in a completely different element. So it is like my own private world, especially when I'm doing underwaters. I love underwaters. Yeah, it's just like, it gets to be me in the water. And I think that's really beautiful. Yeah. What about having brothers and sisters, many of them, four, four sisters, three brothers? I mean, I guess it's nice to have a community of people that are very protective of you too, right? Yeah, it is. And I have had a ton of support from my family and then family that I've met along the way. Like Noah, my boyfriend with his 14 siblings. <laughs> <laughs> I do have an army around me, helping yeah. me, pushing me, making me better each day. Yeah. So um, when, when was the move to the, the Paralympic side of it? How did you first kind of get connected with it? And, and what was that like, you know, first competing in kind of the, the Paralympic world? Well, so for USA Swimming, when you register each year, they have a little box that says, do you have a disability? And you check yes or no. And we always checked no. Uh -huh. And so there's a lot of things I've missed out on because I was like, no, I don't have a disability. But then one year we checked yes. And then Indiana swimming, that's where I grew up. They're like, oh, you have a disability. So you can um, you can swim at state and you can get it. You can get into zones and we can get you exemptions. So so um, then I saw like, oh, things open up to me now mm. that I call it a disability. We individualize training in the pool. So why not individualize your nutrition? Erica Barney of Barney Wellness Building will help you and your swimmers get exactly what each athlete needs through genetic testing and personalized nutrition plans. So stop guessing what you should and shouldn't be putting into your body. Athletes within a few weeks have noticed they're recovering faster because they're fueling their body with what they need and staying away from what their body hates. Erica understands swimming. She gets it. She's worked with over 20 Olympians, including the fastest man in the world, Caleb Dressel. Group discounts are available, so go to Biney Wellness Building and get in touch with Erica today. That's Biney, B-E-I-N-E, wellnessbuilding.net. So my first para meet, uh, when I was 12, even just in that story, I shied away from the word, the word disability. So I never saw anyone that looked like me. I never saw anyone with one hand. And then there's a whole world of disabilities that I've never seen before. So even me having disability, I was also overwhelmed by how different forms and shapes and just what people can do and how mm -hmm. they look. Oh, well, wow. so you're going to regular, you know, able-bodied swim meets. And then all of a sudden around the age of 12, you go to you, you first kind of para um, meet and see other people there and it, and it opens your eyes to a whole new world then. Yes. And it's like exactly what I felt other people do to me where I could see them stare at me and be like, wow, she looks different. I haven't seen that before. Then I caught myself doing that to so many other people. Mm. I'd be like, oh, that's so different. But then I got to recognize like, oh, when people are staring at me, that's more curiosity 
that's not them saying like, uh, what a freak. I look better than you or like, uh, don't want to look at you. So it made me more, uh, I don't know what the right word is, if it's empathetic, but I could understand right. better. And I was easier on myself after right. going to my first pair of meat. Right. What about um, limitations for yourself in the pool? Have you ever felt like you couldn't do anything because of your disability? No, I haven't. Maybe that could be because I don't know what it's like right. to swim with two hands. Right. Uh, swimming has felt like freedom from any limitations. I played volleyball for a while, and that was a very obvious, like, like passing the ball. I could feel like, oh, I'm at a disadvantage. Swimming, I've never felt that. It's been a lot of natural adaptions. Like I have a very strong kick. So I use that to push me through the water. But no, that's the great thing is I haven't felt like I'm at a huge disadvantage in the water. Yeah. What about in terms of um, Im improvements? You know, when you want to make improvements, what are the areas other than kind of working your... Um, you know, your strengths, you know, what, what are some of your weaknesses that you've worked on? So this one is an interesting one. And I guess this could be where I do feel a disability the most. Um, so with freestyle and backstroke, mm -hmm. trying to get my arms like, you know, one, one arms up, the other is just like you're a clock and you want to be at the opposite ends. Mm -hmm. I, cause this arm gets around so much faster. Mm. I'm not always at opposite ends. There'll be points where I'm like this. Mm. So I've been working really hard to change that. And that's a lot of mental effort on being aware of what each part of my body is doing. Mm. So that's a, the biggest thing I've been working on this season. That's super interesting. I hadn't thought of that. The timing. Yeah. I mean, you just think the internal clock in your head just works the timing out. But when one arm is moving a lot faster than the other one, you've got to mentally kind of engage into that. Yes. I have to be very aware of like, how fast this arm like, I need to slow it down in the air, actually, because really? it moves through the water so much faster than my right arm that has that good catch. Right. Wow. Interesting. Is there a stroke that you feel most comfortable with? Oh, butterfly. Butterf butterfly is your stroke. Isn't, is that the one you got the silver medal at, in Tokyo? Yes. Yeah. I, I love butterfly. Very cool. Very cool. Um, how, how do you compare yourself in that situation at the, at the Paralympics like that, when you, when you take the silver medal, do you, do you feel like you're being beaten by someone, you know, equal to you? Like when, when, and we all have different, um, you know, I raced guys that were six foot seven. So it wasn't like, I felt like I was equal to them, you know, like there's big boys out there. So it's like, you know, you never feel completely even kind of thing, but in terms of, somebody beating you at that level you feel pretty satisfied that you got beaten on the day by somebody that, that was better than you specifically for the silver medal the right. girl who got gold yeah yeah she we were even and she got me she did a really awesome job but para is it's interesting with the different classifications and it'll get better as para matures and we'll be able to have more numbers and get disabilities um equally classified so I race, um, I'm an S9. So mm -hmm. I race individuals with one limb impairment. So girls with one arm or girls with one leg. Mm -hmm. So where it gets a little tricky is, um, does a hand equal a leg? Mm -hmm. And in some events, like you'll see a lot of arm amputees swimming butterfly and breaststroke. And then you'll see a lot of a leg amputees winning freestyle and backstroke. Mm -hmm. But that that's an awareness thing as Paralympic grows, that'll get better and better. But that's why the biggest area we're like, is it even, you don't know, but it also, I don't think it matters. Well, race, wait, wait, explain that. Race. What do you mean by it doesn't matter? I, we're competitors. Mm -hmm. They're to race, not to um, pick and pull each other's disabilities apart or spend so much time on, is it even, is it fair? And with Paris specifically, like, there's a lot of things that goes into it. And if we dive too much onto that, we're taking away from the competing part, what we're actually there to do, the most right. important thing. Right. 
So you never feel sorry for yourself then going into a you know a race and like, well, that person has two legs, you know, there's nothing I can do about it, kind of thing. You know, it's like it's, no, it's it that. makes winning that much better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I always love beating guys that were bigger than me. Like I said, you know, I'm, I'm only six foot two as a sprinter, so the, I was on the short end. So I loved beating guys that were bigger than me. It was it wasn't like I cried about it. I I loved it. And then when they and then when they beat me, it was like, well, that's it. This is it. I was just beaten on the day. So I guess the competitive side for you kicks in the most, which is the, the best approach in the end. Yeah, and I remember as a kid feeling that too, as I was racing all able-bodied kids mm. so then winning races it made me the most proud of my armor i'd walk around like gotcha <laughs> <laughs> i love that that's very smart i like that did you do you ever come up with stories of how you lost your arm like do you come up with um, elaborate stories oh yes for kids now that i'm coaching <laughs> they beginning of each season they ask they want to hear something cool like I mean, a shark is a classic, and that's like a, yeah. a go-to wow thing. And they're like, no way. <laughs> and then I have to break into him. I grew up in Indiana, so it wasn't a shark. <laughs> but then we make up other stories. So we'll tell them, um, like, you have to streamline, or the shark that lives under the bulkhead, come and cap your arm. That's what happened to Coach Lizzie. So we'll make up <laughs> stories like that. That's very cool. I like that. Now, I was reading in your bio, it says that one of your coaches is Ian Crocker. Is that correct? Yes. Wow. Like the Ian Crocker. I am the luckiest swimmer to get to swim with him, especially as a butterfly. I bet. Tell, tell me what that's like. Give me some in, inside info. Oh. Ian's probably my favorite person in the world up there. Wow. Um, it's been really nice for me finding a coach who understands in so many deep ways that not a ton of other people do, even the schedule of being a professional athlete. And we even share getting fourth, hundred fly by hundred of a second, share mm -hmm. that together. And just our approach to swimming, we speak a very similar language. We're both very feel oriented, mm -hmm. very thoughtful with our swims. So that lines up really great. Instead of someone who pounds the yardage, we get to be very thoughtful. And it's made me a way better swimmer and also a way better coach. I get to learn a lot from him. Yeah. Well, look, he, he's the master of butterfly and you're a butterfly. So what can you tell us that he's taught you? How does he talk about butterfly? We look at it almost like a dance. We talk a lot about rhythm. So even mm -hmm. in the call room in Tokyo, I have a voice recording of Ian counting to four that I'll just listen to over and over. So we do it just like a dance. So like one, two, three, four. And then we can build on the momentum like that. So yeah, it's kind of like a dance class where we really focus on, on the rhythm and not attacking the water, but how to work with the water. Wow. And where does the rhythm for you come from? Is it your your feet, your hips, your hands? What, what, where does it start? So I kind of have my, I have like two points on my body that are like my trigger points. It's like my chest right here, that's point right. one. So I'll push that down. And then my hips. So it's like mm. chest and hips. Right. And then my legs, feet follow. Okay. So you're, you're pressing here and then you're using your hips as, as part of that dance, that rhythm. Okay. Nice. And is that the way you teach it? Um, we've been very lucky now that you're, you're doing some clinics for fitter and faster swim clinics. And I put you on a bunch of clinics where you're teaching kids now, um, you know, in, in very short, small periods of time, you know, a couple of hours with them where it's very um, intensive. So how are you teaching butterfly to these kids? So with kids, you have to throw so many things out and figure out what language each one speaks. So I'll try using like a Shakira method of like, okay, we're going to pretend like we're belly dancing. So get on the mm. deck and, and practice like we're belly dancing with our whole body. And if that hits for some of them, awesome. And then for other ones, just got to take them through, like push your chest up to the sky, then your hips, then your knees, then your toes. So try to give them like different points and different ways to visualize what I'm going to ask them to do. But those are my two go-to ones. Right.
I'd like to introduce our newest sponsor, Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. Awesome. Now, obviously, underwaters are a strength of yours. How, how do you work on your underwaters? What are some of the things that you do? For underwaters, it's, I mean, the biggest thing is consistency. Every day we'll do a set called Dolphin Endurance, and that's, typically it's 475s, and you go halfway off of each wall underwater. But doing, like, um, rhythm check-ins, so I'll do like a skull drill and that just gets everything warmed up, gets my body loosened and ready to do a whole whip and right. then build on that and do then work on feet too, point feet. and toes kind of in. Do you work on your flexibility of your feet as well? Yes. We'll do where we sit on our feet and lean back. Yeah. Yeah. Now what about for strength training? What do you do there? I love strength training, especially as I've gotten older. I've turned to make strength training um, a little bit less than swimming, but almost equal. I look for strength training a lot. So I do a lot of jumps to work on my explosive, and that's like my test set for the week. And I go back three and a half years of data to see how far I've jumped. So I'll do a lot of jumps to work on an explosive and um, a lot of adaptive deadlifts, which I love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and squats and a lot of lap pull downs i got my first prosthetic arm in 2019 and that's been a huge game changer for upper body well, what do you mean tell me how you utilize that oh it's for the first time in my life when i got the arm i was able to do pull-ups and push-ups so what is it is it attached here and then is it a um some sort of like hook device where it holds on so it's um so I put a sleeve on my arm. I pushed I had my arm in here. So I put the right. silicone sleeve on mm -hmm. and it has this screw at the top of it. And then I have this black carbon fiber arm that then I slide on and I have a bunch of different attachments that I can put at the end of my arm. So I have oh. um, some cool hooks <laughs> and just things that attach to a barbell. Gotcha. So you can just grab onto the barbell on the on the left side. Yep. Right. All right, all right. Do you have do you have feeling um, throughout the whole limb? Yes, I do. Yeah, so I can feel all the way around. So it hurts. Uh, with the arm on, <laughs> yes, it squeezes really tight, and then because yeah. it's a silicone sleeve, it'll pull off of my arm too. Right. But yeah. I deadlifted two fifty five with it, so really doing okay. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Dang, who, who writes your strength program for you? It's, um, he's a football guy that I found in Austin. Mm. So I found him through, he does this thing, it's called RPR. Mm -hmm. And it's really fascinating. So I'll find ways that my body's compensating to get movements done. Say, um, just for an example, like I'm squatting and to get the movement done, like I'm going like this with my face, like I'm tightening my face really tight to get it done. He'll see that, okay, I'm, something's not quite activated in my lower body that's supposed to be what's getting the movement done mm -hmm. so he goes in and there's different points in the body body's pretty incredible how it's all connected but he might like go in right here and push up and just give my body a whole reset mm. and then allow me to do a squat again and then i don't need to use my face to get it done wow. so that's how i originally found him but it's like magic i swear by it wow how come i mean how'd you find him in the first place Oh, my dad actually found him through yeah. uh, books and research and online oh, wow. searches. Okay, so he's, he's pretty well known then, I guess. If you look in the right areas, <laughs> working on getting him more well known, because what he yeah. does really is great. Well, what's his name? So we can get him a little bit more, more well known. So it's Mark Rogers. Mark his Rogers, okay. Mark Rogers in Austin, Texas. There we go. Let's, let's, get, him, let's get him some business. All right, Mark Rogers. Um, 
What about in terms of sponsors or anything? I mean, uh, funding. How do you how do you survive other than obviously you're working as a coach and doing some clinics for fitter and faster? But are there are there other methods of money coming in? So coaching and swimming stipend those are my main ways. But for the last couple of years, I've been really fortunate to get to be part of Arena, so that's mm. been really great. Wow, that's excellent. Yeah, that's nice. And so uh in, in terms of um tech suits too those things can be expensive so it's nice that you've got somebody that's looking after you on that side yes and they've been really good to me and they have a couple other paralympians jessica long is one of them and right. sophie herzog she was an athlete too and right. they've been great with para athletes pushing us giving us more exposure yeah it's, yeah awareness is the biggest thing excellent so well listen you you're a two-time paralympian um you're planning on being a third i imagine right Yes, the gap being smaller makes it easier to manage. And I'm still hungry for another one. But really for this next go at training, I want to see how much more I can grow the movement through my swimming. More and more opportunities are becoming available for para-athletes just to get us more equal to our able-bodied counterparts. Right. And so I want to see what all I can contribute these next three years. When you say more equal, where do you think that things aren't equal? Uh, exposure is a big one. Um, even doing more stuff with USA Swimming, like going to pro meets would be great because we don't have many meets this year. I haven't been able to race actually since Tokyo. Right. So getting us more together really mm. is the goal. Mm. Which is interesting because it, it, that's the way it is in Australia. Did you know that? Australia, Australia the, they're, they're connected. You know, every yes, time we a had lot a of meet. countries are. Australia is mm. Canada. Mm -hmm. we're kind of behind on this actually you are actually and which is kind of fascinating i hadn't thought of it from your perspective but from from coming from australia it was always just the norm and and maybe i just took it for granted that it was always just a normal thing and we were always together but here it's not for sure i just came from chicago they had the the tier pro series and and uh no paralympic athletes there that wouldn't it wouldn't hurt any to have a couple of extra heats right no i that would do a lot of good. It would yeah. do a lot of good for swimming. It would do a lot of good for the biggest group of minorities, people with disabilities. But yeah. So, so is, there, is there people fighting for this within USA Swimming now? Is there is there some sort of organization movement to try and make this happen? Mm, trying to, working on that, working on getting things together. But I think the biggest thing we can do as athletes, like get more para swimmers on LSC boards, just get more para athlete voices at the mm. table because yeah. i think a lot of this it's not being heard as much or by not enough people to actually yeah. push to make it happen well listen you're on the number one swimming podcast in the world right now which is excellent um i mean that's what i tell myself anyway i'm not sure if that's true but <laughs> um <laughs> i read it's true <laughs> we've got a follow a small following so uh let's get your message out there let's get your voice out there and um and, and thanks for sharing your story today. It's been interesting to get to know you more. So I appreciate it. And uh, good luck over the next couple of years in the lead up to Paris. Paris is going to be exciting. Have you ever been to Paris? I have been to Paris. I'm beautiful. excited to go back. Yeah, beautiful spot. So it'll be, it'll be great to get there. Well, good luck with the, the quest for the third Paralympics. And um, thanks for doing this today, okay? Thank you so much for having me on. All right, take care, Lizzie. Bye.